on these weekly tapes, the main thrust would apparently be me speaking to the people here in person. But we now have people in other cities seeing these tapes. They're being made available in some other cities on a weekly basis, just shortly after we are meeting here. And I'm allowing open meetings so that there are people walking in off the streets in other cities and seeing these weekly tapes, oft times with absolutely no sort of preparation. So you can imagine, you people who have heard some of this already, how strange this may sound. And to tell you people who may be seeing all of this for the first time, I am aware of how strange it may sound. With all, to some people, it does not sound strange enough. <laughs> as my, I guess I could be seen as being a most improbable guru. And I receive continuing communiques from people out of town that have only had a limited exposure to this, to me via these tapes. And there is a continuing interest, as there has been on some of you people's part, of what is it exactly that I should be doing. People who have seen one tape, I, one of these weekly tapes, or two or three of these tapes, continue to write me and to express some interest that they can't really understand what I'm saying, or else it is transparently clear what I'm saying. And there seems to be something about all of this that intrigues them, and they may come back and watch some more tapes if I would go ahead and tell them what they should do. Now, if any of you newer people stay in this long enough and you go back and pick up some of the older tapes or some of the things I have written, you would find out that I periodically go through some of this. I make some mention of it. And here I go again. There are several distinct aspects of which you should be aware. If I mention it, it should be, as you say, transparently clear, except for the fact that you forget about it, that you only say it's transparently clear when you hear it mentioned or when you read someone mentioning it. And that's first off that the world is divided into, believe it or not, two kinds of people. Say I for the 103rd mode of making such a division. This one has to do with transfer of energy. In the past, I referred to it as being people who, and I mean this literally, people who are inherently through their own genetic makeup are dominant. And then those who likewise are as mechanically wired up, those who are submissive. If we were back on the playground, you could call it born leaders and born followers. And regardless of what some snake oil salesman may have arranged for a clinic at your local Holiday Inn, followers cannot be made into leaders. Submissive people cannot be made into dominant people. There is an absolute genetic, and I say genetic, it even goes into biochemical processes in the humans that turn out everything from local politicians in your ward, the mayor of some small town, all the way from that to a Stalin, to a Hubert Humphrey. If you think back to your childhood days, especially you men, you women were not as involved with it, but you had every occasion to observe it. But back at the playground, there was always guys that seemed to push everybody else around. If you've got any sort of memory, you can think back to the age of six or seven, to the first grade on the playground. There was always somebody on the playground. It was more physical in the red circuit. But even back in the classroom, there were always people 
that seemed to be the ones that were the top dog, and they just happened, and they would attract people around them. There are also other people that were wired up to be commentators on it, those that seemed to stand aside and complain about it, but they still fall into the submissive group. The reason I point this out and remind you again, it has nothing to do with what you call environment because what you call environment is simply the genetic power of those around you that they are made, they are wired up, their genetic codes and their internal biochemical processes are such that they seem to present to you a background, a milieu. They seem to present outside forces, but to them they are not outside forces, to them you are outside forces. It is all wired up in the DNA and the genetic codes, it is in the genetic deck of cards that is dealt out and no one is immune from it. The reason I mention this is almost without exception, people drawn to this want to be told what to do. Now, at least you think that you make up some very questionable subclass in humanity. Let me point out that someone who shows up for one of these courses of how I made $2 million in six weeks selling real estate and they go and take a course and pay $500 for it. They want to be told what to do. And it may be lots of men showing up in shark skin suits and long wavy hair, and they may be decent salesmen, but they're still there to be told what to do. Those that are faithful followers of religion are wanting to be told what to do. They are submissive. When I say submissive, that does not entail what you may consider to be, or your own voice's present connotation. It is not a backhanded slap at people. It is not to say that some group, my dominant people, are the active ones making everything work, and then we got these submissive ones, which are simply cannon fodder. It's not that simple, because the submissive ones are as active as the dominant ones, because if it comes to numbers, you should surely figure out yourself they're more submissive people than there are dominant people. So at least you take it as a mechanical insult of saying that almost everyone attracted to this is submissive. Remember this, if we could play with justice, all the submissive people would get together and whip the shit out of all the dominant people because <laughs> they're greatly outnumbered. Of course, that's fooling with justice because notice the submissive people never do it. <laughs> sort of an aside, having really nothing to do with politics, but, uh, for instance, in your lifetime, it's always been there, but in your lifetime, there are continuing stories, political commentators, ordinary people, maybe you, maybe your neighbors, someone will express absolute disbelief. They'll say, look at, for instance, the USSR, and every story you hear of the people just being in dominated from the top down, their whole life regulated, regimented, and someone here says, how in the world they put up with it? Boy, there, it must be a terrible system, there must be armed guards in every hallway of every apartment, they must be on every corner, they must shoot people every hour to keep them living that way, because I know I wouldn't do that, and it's not so. If people did not want to be submissive, if they were not wired up to be, then they would simply overthrow the government. Take it from what would seem to be a political situation into a two-party relationship, a man and a woman, a sexual relationship. And you hear some outside party commenting about poor old Gladys. She's been fooling around with Hubert now for going on to a year, and that man treats her like dirt. He walks all over her. Her opinion's worth nothing. He won't listen to any of her comments. How does she put up with it? The old story, of course, is you find out that she had one just like Hubert before he ran off and left her, before he died. 
that the outside apparent observations that someone is being mistreated is not true. There is a transfer of energy going on. You can look at it as being a transfer of heat even. It is a form of show business. It is some, one person on stage and the other person is the audience. One person apparently makes all the decisions and the other person apparently is just quite delighted that there is someone to tell me exactly what to do. Ordinarily, this would fall within the realm, according to the voices in ordinary people, they would say, well, this is in the realm of psychological commentaries of some kind or sociological observations, having to do with the kind of peer pressures, the kind of sociological pressures on people that might make one, due to their childhood, might make one think less of themselves and their own opinions and therefore be more gullible. But as that great philosopher and guru used to say, if you remember, that is a ball of hog wax. People are wired up to do this, all comments notwithstanding, all third party observations being of no importance. And those of you seeing some of this for the first few times have got to realize whether I'm your first exposure, which is doubtful, or whether you've been through some other would-be groups, tried to pursue some religion, some mystical organization, you have got to see that you're attempting to submit yourself to something. Now, I know that the voices in many of you would still want to argue that point, and they, your voices would say, well, what I wanted was to find out the secret. I wanted to meet someone. I didn't want to submit myself to someone. I don't want to be some goddamn follower to some guy with a towel wrapped around his head and a glue on beard. <laughs> But I do not have the full information. I do not know all of the tricks. I do not know the secrets written down in the great holy hidden books. All I want to know is what the secrets are, what the methods are, and I'll take it from there. And it's not true. The voices will say, I do not want to be a follower. I do not want to be told what to do except that which would be good for me, and I'll recognize it when I hear it. And that's two balls of hog wax. You might as well be varnishing your shins. <laughs> then ordinarily what you are left with, or what you're confronted with, as many of you know, either from your own experience or from your own observations, which now we have plenty of gurus who've come out of the cave. <laughs> now they're out in the streets, they're on the covers of magazines and newspapers. And their apparent methods and what they teach, quite available. But what you would be confronted with, that many of you feel is lacking here, is some form of, some sort of uniformity. And it can take on very mundane trappings such as, and do not discount what I'm about to point out to you, that if this group of people apparently collected around some leader, some system, are brought into some type of uniformity, some identifying common traits, shaving their heads, wearing green robes, wearing purple shoes, wearing purple socks, a secret handshake, a symbol tattooed on their forehead. It's something that seems to unify them. It's not funny, it's not a joke, and there's nothing to be criticized because it serves a purpose. It does not serve my purposes, but there is built into the wiring system in you that is not that far removed from a herd, a pack of dogs although I know everyone wants to believe otherwise, a band of mad squirrels, deranged chipmunks, 
but there is a longing to be brought into some unique community. Now let us say that you have seen one or two or a handful of my tapes and something seems to strike you. Something you can't really describe. You keep coming back in these cities and you watch the tape and you feel like perhaps I found something here that's of some value. There is built into you, it is there in these other cities that you keep hoping, you keep waiting that the group already collected there. You assume that there are people who have been there longer than you have, that there's somebody there in those other cities more closely connected with me than you brand new people. And you keep waiting for it to be revealed that there are certain absolute physical requirements that would create a sense of a singular community that you are all going to have to blank. It is not psychological because it is common throughout humanity. It is common in every, as you call it, culture. It is common to every, as you call it, religion. It is common all the way from the Boy Scouts to the Marines to the Catholic Church to a motorcycle club, to a collection of men who restore classic cars. They have periodic meetings. They'll have little windbreakers. We can be talking about men and women of substantial means in the community, doctors and attorneys, and they'll have these little windbreakers with a little custom-drawn logo called the Old Farts Classic Car Club of Duluth. And they will wear it, and it's not funny. There's nothing wrong with it. They are not treading on some path of folly. But that is an immediate assumption when people get together. And it seems to be more so here. That at least we need some sort of emblem that we can all wear around our necks. Something that creates a sense of unity. That we are some kind of community. Now, as you have seen, this has not been immediately forthcoming. And I might go ahead and hint to you that uh, it may not be fifth or sixth coming. <laughs> but if it were, what I want you to try to do to stretch your consciousness is try without listening to any of the internal judgmental voices, is try and hear me that if, this was almost an immediate disclosure to you. After you had attended three tapes, you were told, all right, you must shave off part of your hair back here, or you must shave off all the hair on your legs if you're a man, if you're a woman, you got the blue sum on your legs. <laughs> here is a pendant that you must give us you know, $2,000 for. I held it personally, I slept on it. You gotta wear it around your neck at all times, and here's a secret handshake that you've got to do. Every morning, you've got to make some kind of plea to me, or you've got to put my picture on the wall. Everybody in the beginning would feel better about this. No matter that you may still think that you've got voices that have poo-pooed <laughs> all of that sort of activity. If I said that everyone is doing this, and what you had been exposed to of me thus far, seems to be captious, you would accept this and you would feel better for it. You are wired up if you are human. I'm assuming it's only humans giving any great attention to this tape. But if you are a human, you are wired up that you would have felt better already. There would have been the sensation that you had taken some sort of step, that you had gone to the effort about me continuing to be too foolish, as I am proclived to do. Maybe I didn't make you shave your legs or blue hair on your legs. You just had to pay $2,000 for this pendant. You had to pay $550 for this color photograph of myself. You had to put it up and you had to go through a certain ritual every day. Then every time you met somebody else, 
connected with this, you had to give a secret handshake. If there were a few of these things, you would have already felt better. You would have felt as though, for the time being at least, you would have felt as though I have taken a step forward. I like what I've heard for some reason, and now I feel like I am closer to it. It's a fact, and you need to realize it. The lack of me doing that is also a fact you must realize that those who have survived for a length of time do not find this to be a continual pressing problem, but I am acutely aware of you newer people feeling as though, on the one hand, I'm attracted to this, and something seems to strike me periodically from viewing these tapes, and yet I feel like that I'm just wandering in and out here in this city, in these group of people. Nobody will talk to me. Nobody will tell me who he is. Nobody tries to recruit me. Nobody calls me. Nobody will listen to my problems. Nobody else is talking about problems. I just come and go, and I feel like I'm missing something. Hence the communiques of, I like what I've heard, but would you please tell me, you know, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? If I may shoot off at a semi-oblique angle and recap some of this, let me note that in a very real way this is a continuing problem in that we are assuming the day is not going to arrive that this becomes a regimented form of some pseudo-community, that is, of me requiring everyone dress in a certain way, everyone must act a certain way. Here is a model of what we should be, and you've got to fulfill it at least on the surface. Assuming that day will never arrive, then you have, in a sense, a continuing, for you new people, I'll say problem. After a certain length of time, if you belong in this and you survive, we could say it becomes a continuing kind of concern. Then perhaps a little later it becomes a continuing kind of curiosity. <laughs> but it will linger for a long time because it is wired up in each and every person. And so that part of your biochemical system, the very force that keeps us all alive, that makes you want to eat, to drink, to relieve yourself, to screw, to get some exercise, or conversely, to get no exercise. <laughs> as basic as that is the feeling that you want to be taken in to a community. That at least here's a little community. You know that there are other communities. You got the churches, you got the synagogues, you got all the world's great religions, you got political parties, you got bird watching societies, you got chess clubs, you got running organizations. So on the surface, this is simply another community, another organization. To be an organization, there has got to be a titular head to it. There's got to be some kind of hierarchy. But there's primarily got to be a head, and there's got to be a body. So apparently, I'm the head. And everybody says, all right, how do I be part of the body? That sounds better than saying leader and follower to some of you people who still got voices that choke on that. As an aside, I might also note, if you really choke on that, if you had the ability to learn anything, you'd wonder why that upsets you so much. I ain't no goddamn follower. Said the person, how long have you been watching these tapes? Well, about six, eight months now. I ain't no follower. <laughs> and then write me saying, why don't I get more out of this? You're in charge, tell me why I don't. What should I do? <laughs> For any community, that is, organization, to survive, there has to be an apparent leader, alive or dead. When he's dead, then is when you have to worry about the hierarchy, which is a form of a leader. You know, the Pope and the Catholic Church. 
and all the cardinals and sparrows and everybody. It's to make up for the lack of an apparent living head as the hierarchy becomes a stand-in for the deceased head. And then everybody else is the body. And you find that it is almost impossible to get the sort of feeling that you would have even in the most mundane organization, a local political club, the sort of feeling that you would have that you belong to something, that somebody gives you something to do, that you and this little group are in charge of handbills this time for Councilwoman's so-and-so's campaign, and this other group's in charge of mail solicitations for the young Republicans throughout the year. Everybody has a job. Everyone seems as though they have a purpose in being there. And then there is someone, a pope, a priest, an elected yearly president of the young Republicans, someone to say, well done, that your job is such and such. Did you do it? And you say, yes, I did. And I say, very good. Now we'll move on to something else. There are things to be specifically done. Those of you just getting exposed to this from afar, one other thing that I guess all of you have suspected, it is not the same seeing this on tape, even if it's just a week later, somewhere else than it is being here but I am not inferring that if you moved from wherever you're seeing this tape and came here, that after a week here in my brilliant presence, that it would suddenly all become crystal clear and you'd have no more questions. But there is an absolute inescapable difference. But to many of you, it seems as though that I am too strong on talking about things in general and not enough on telling you, all right, damn it, Here's what you've got to do. When you have the sense of a singular community, an identifiable organization with a head and a body, it follows. It happens as mechanically as the cycle of the weather from the oceans to the clouds and back again and into the rivers and into the oceans and the moisture going up. It is a self-fueling organism that once something seems to be established, it is named and there is a head and then there is a functioning body to it. Any question of what to do is no question at all. It happens. If you tried to, if that wasn't clear enough, any of you who doubt that, Go run an ad in the paper, put signs on bulletin board in the libraries at the local supermarkets and make up an organization. You know, the Triangular Earth Society. All those who believe the, that the world, that the Earth may be triangular in shape or anything else. Those who, you know, the Franz von Suppe Appreciation Society, <laughs> which I doubt there's one, but someone you know, would like to bring back the past questionable glory of Franz von Suppe and the poet and the peasant and all of his great numbers. So anyone who would like to help form such an organization, call me. Now assume you get some calls. And you get together and you all say, boy, how much we love the music of Franz von Suppe and they treat the man like a hack. He doesn't get his right desserts. We'll get together. We'll collect all his music. We all got records. We'll swap records. We'll petition the local symphony or the local pops to do more. Von Suppe songs. I mean, the son of a bitch wrote like one a week, to the best of my knowledge, for eight or ten years. So he's got plenty in the repertoire. All I'll get is dig it out. So you get a group of people, and you sit around and you decide, yes, we love him and we should do something. And since you put in the thing, the ad, let's assume that they all say, look, we're meeting at your house and it's your idea. Won't you, we need an organization, won't you be president? And you say, okay, I will. Right then, any question of what to do next is over. If you don't believe it, go try it. That just you and another group of people that you've attracted agree that we all have a common interest. Franz von Suppe, the possibility of the world is triangular in shape. 
you and a group of people, and they say, just let's assume the automatic list would happen, that why don't you be in charge at least for the time being? It was your idea, just you be in charge. I mean, you, and you say, okay, that is it. There'll be no question. It's as though physically, not in some kind of strange psychological or metaphysical way, but physically now, you and these other people have become an organism. You have become a community. But all organisms to live have got to have a purpose. They have an aim, and as soon as it becomes an organism, you do not have to sit around. You and the people have to decide. All right, we all love Van Supe, and let's do all we can to promote him. Yay! And won't you be in charge? Okay, I will. All right, everybody gets a cup of coffee. What should we do? The question no sooner gets out of somebody's mouth than the answer is there. Try it. It has become a living organism, and there will be no difficulty. You will not sit around, you and this group of people, the rest of the evening in silence, pondering what can we do? What should we do? Just as soon as there's a head and just as soon as there's an apparent cohesiveness to you and this group of people in the Franz von Suppe Appreciation Society, the organism will begin to breathe. It will begin to eat. It will begin to transfer energy. It will begin to put out signals in the same way your stomach does when you are physically hungry. In the way in which you are sexually aroused and you begin to look for satisfaction. This organism, nobody has to come up and prod it and say, wake up. Wake up, you Franz von Suppe Appreciation Society organism, you. It will immediately begin to breathe, it will begin to move, it will begin to display motivation. If you have any sensation of what I'm talking about, then ponder this. I have done almost the opposite, <laughs> willfully. That apparently there's a head and apparently there's a body. Not only here where I'm doing these tapes, but in other cities, groups of people. And many of you keep expecting. Well, all of you expect, but many of you now specifically expect and want to question me about it. It's all right, we've got the community, we've got the organism. What are we going to do? Who do, I go, who do I go recruit? Who do I go kill? Who do I go love? Who do I go insult? When do I buy my robe? When do I shave my legs? It seems to be a very specific difficulty for many people. I have spent a fair number of years involved with the people in this city to the point that I have, in a sense, enough people who are beyond the point of some of these very mechanical, although very real concerns, people who can function without having to continually entertain notions of what's the purpose in this, what might this accomplish, what if I fail, what if I get to the point that I cannot tell whether I'm failing or succeeding? <laughs> what if I get to the point that I cannot tell whether I'm failing or succeeding and no one, that is the head, seems to tell me whether I'm failing or succeeding? But I have enough people that I do not have to continually turn my attention to that here. But I think I will talk a little bit about what should I do? Everyone with any exposure to this and with any sort of burgeoning insight or taste for it should be able to find this very curious. It is so curious that those with limited exposure slash interest slash need or find it a circular self-consuming flash map, which you may hear it for a second and then it's gone, but you should find it curious 
that I have spent many, many hours, even written some of those books that we had publicly published, that seem to be commenting on the nature of how things are as opposed to how they can be, when it gets closer and closer, some of you see that there is no difference between how things are and how things should be. If that is too opaque, it would almost be as though you had a good, wound up, down home American Protestant evangelist stalking the stage, waving a holy book, pounding on a podium, crying, sweating, loosening his tie, pleading, falling on his knees, and the message was, there ain't nothing wrong. Can't you people realize it? And he pounds and he cries that the gods want you to understand that everything is perfect, everything you've done is fine. Something would surely be amiss. This cannot happen, of course, but if it could happen, if you can hear that right quick, you should find that very curious. But if you can transfer it over very quickly, many of you got strangled some weeks back when I said, uh, when I gave you what was close to a real cosmic possibility as opposed to a great cosmic law, since I won't tell you that, a great God, that being that either you do or you don't. Some of you people here and some of you people are getting this on tape in other cities have written me, please that are mind to expressing your different degrees of potential strangulation. Some of you had voices in you that found that to either be, again, transparently obvious and of no great consequence, or some of you found that to be stifling to the point of you feeling as though if this were true, then there's nothing to be done, which is not the point because that falls within either you do or you don't. All right, I heard that, and I, f I feel as though this, that just means there's nothing to be done. Well, some people feel as though there's nothing to be done, and some feel as though there's something to be done. And in your case, you felt as though, well, if that's true, there's nothing to be done. But you cannot escape that great cosmic suggestion. There is no way out, as long as you are simply what you are wired up to be. There is no way out. For those who say, wait, that means there is no way out. Hey, for those that say, hey, fuck that shit, I don't believe it. <laughs> you can't get away from it. You either do or you don't. The subtle suggestions, at least, as I have tried to lay upon thee at times, after pointing out that there is physically a reality to this. It is an excitement of the brain, the nervous system itself. It is an alteration specifically of the biochemical activity that surges throughout the human body and cultivating itself into the realm that most of you now want to think of as being your own consciousness, your own individuality, or your own mind. There is a way to alter it which is no secret. People have known for thousands of years that it can be altered through alcohol, it can be altered through certain herbs and drugs and funny weeds that you can smoke and rub on the soles of your feet. If that were the proper way of doing it, we'd all be doing it. I'd be doing it. All of this has always been about being able to directly affect, to alter gradually and then permanently, it alters the internal workings, the biochemical and the electrical workings, the firings of the brain itself, certain substances in the blood, various systems that excite and calm the body, systems that seem to have a direct effect on how you respond to the environment in a very basic physical way. That is, it seems to be the basis of one's health vis-a-vis -vis the environment. When that can be done, this 
possible axiom of either you do or you don't then takes on a complete different meaning because then either you do or you don't is not one equation. It is no longer It's no longer either you do or you don't. It's then either you do or you don't. A simple one part of the equation is then balanced out by something else. It is then, such as my old drawing of the nervous system, that up to the level of consciousness, line level consciousness, is down in here. That's what everybody else is faced with. And if you can activate it up here, you have changed it. That either you do or you don't is now no longer a binary concept. That's all one concept. <laughs> that you're either this now or you're that. And it's of no consequence. It doesn't matter either you do or you don't. It doesn't matter in any given situation that I am wired up such that I don't believe that. Or I'm wired up as though I do believe that. It's the same thing. It's no longer then an either or situation. All of this is then another part of a new either or. Am I making that clear enough? It then becomes but the way that the human intellect, your consciousness is now wired up, is everything is of a binary situation. And to hear me say, for me to keep hinting, that there is supreme unrecognized importance, I'm talking about supreme, of either you do or you don't. But as soon as the ordinary consciousness hears that, it takes it as what it seems to be. That that is a binary, that is an either or situation. And if that's the extent of our possibilities, hell, I'm wasting my time doing anything. Well, that's either you do or you don't. That falls in there. You, you heard it, and you went, wow, how depressing. What a bummer. You old dude. That's either you do or you don't. And some apps went, hey, that is very encouraging. That explains a lot. Same thing. If you can get the nervous system, if you can get your own consciousness, if you can get your own brain activated, which all this is about, beyond that level, then either you do or you don't is in a completely different position because then it's not an either or situation. The either or situation is I'm either above either you do or you don't or I'm not. And that's it. <coughs> And if you're not above it, then down here it doesn't make a rat's ass, <laughs> as we say in the religious biz. <laughs> of saying, I've always had a great deal of respect for uh, the Jewish faith. And somebody else says, uh, just a bunch of shit like everything else. That tells you nothing. Or someone says, uh, I can understand the Christians and the Muslims fighting the way they do in Beirut. We've got to do something about it. So no consequence. Someone's saying, I believe that the world is certainly going downhill. And someone says, I believe that things are probably going to get better. I really do. All of that is either you do or you don't. If you use the kinds of maps, if you use some of the methods that I have detailed in the past, you have got to see the information's in you. It's not in me. It's not just you taking these words because we're just playing again with a temporary biochemical change of you listening to me. And sometimes it seems to have a positive effect on you and sometimes it seems to have a negative effect on you. But that's simply, either you do or you don't. <laughs> that you keep listening for me, for someone else to say, all right, listen. And then everybody who hears the following statement goes, oh my God, wow, now I see it. If you're still waiting on that, you should be in the Young Republicans. Or you should, perhaps, give more of your interest to Franz von Suppe. Because <laughs> you're certainly not waiting for anything of any better importance. It is not going to happen.
but the information you're a walking laboratory. You're a walking textbook of the DNA of humanity, of everybody. Any of you who sincerely entertain the voices in you and the notions in you that say to events you hear about, the slaughter of one religion against another in modern day Lebanon, for you to entertain voices in you that say, I can't understand that, the gods have gone mad. There is no excusing this. There is no understanding this. If you sincerely entertain those voices in you, that kind of static that is already wired up, chemically primed in your own brain long before you got here, it was already there. If you entertain those voices as being serious, you are wasting your time in this. You simply find out that I can separate myself from those voices. The voices go on, and there's something else left in me. There's something left in me that's beyond either you do or you don't. There's something left beyond, temporarily. I can hold it for a few seconds. Beyond these voices that find it all to be of no great consequence, that the voices that either say you do or you don't are not of any consequence to you. They're not actually speaking for you. But then you slide back in it. And it's as though you've fallen back into a dream. Or you step back into a hole. You've gone back underwater. You're back to being yourself. The information, everything you need to know as far as getting a foothold is right here. You're walking around with it. The nervous system is not constructed in such a way to easily, said he in his characteristically understated manner, <laughs> to easily see what's going on. And there are those who can hear that and those who can't. And neither one of them's right. <laughs> those who say you can't are in the majority at most any given time, and those who say you can are misled. <laughs> that is, they don't do it. <laughs> Everything, for you newer people, at least you think that I am getting too esoteric at times, let's just take what you call your mind, your daydreams, your thoughts, everything you think is being, take as being yourself. You have no idea what is going on. If someone stops and asks you, such as me bringing up now, what in the hell are you thinking? What's going on in you right now? All right, everybody, stop and dig it. All right, you might come up with four or five words, maybe a dozen words. It was like that I suddenly said, what are you watching on TV? It was like you were watching TV over here in the corner and watching me at the same time on the TV, but you were another TV is over here with a game show or the news. And I suddenly say, hey, I saw you with one eye. You keep watching the news over here with that other set. All right, right quick. Now listen to me, and you listen. Now watch me. But what's going on over there? And it's like you suddenly turn and you get just the last few words of what they just said. Dan Rather just said something about, and so the government said that they're going to have to break up the picket lines there in front of the plant. That's about it. What were you thinking before that? God only knows unless you're going to lie about it. You don't know. At any given time, you're walking around. You're functioning as a supposedly an adult, regular person. And if I suddenly jumped out behind the closet door and said, all right, what were you thinking just then? If you say that you know you're a liar, you don't belong here, you're an idiot. I shouldn't say that. You're a fine person. <laughs> but you don't belong here amongst these other idiots. <laughs> you ought to go out and start a school of psychology. <laughs> the running laboratory is in your own head. Nobody knows what they're thinking, and your head is not arranged to easily, to say the very least. Just try it right now. It is not arranged for your head to suddenly turn on itself, your brain. There are not areas that's not wired up for your brain to look at itself in the same way that you think you're looking at me and listening to me, for you to turn and look at your own brain and to watch what's going on. Different stages of awareness of this, and it's changed throughout the history of man. It's not the same now as it was 2,500 years ago. But inside of 
every religion somewhere, inside of every would-be so-called mystical school that survived, somewhere in there is some kind of message about this. Now, it varies from time to time slightly. I'm not going to give you a lesson in history. But it varies slightly to take an English translation of some Chinese text from 2000 BC. And you find, after covering a span of nearly 4,000 years, a different rearrangement of the DNA, the genetic background of us, is not exactly the same as the Chinese. And forget this thing about culture. That's just a short cut term. You are not the same as a Chinese person right now. You're not the same, especially as a Chinese person 4,000 years ago. So given that, that it spanned that length of horizontal time and a change in the basic, a general change in the genetic structure of you and somebody who is Chinese, but you can find that there's still some sort of message, some kind of attempt that they had, and it's a would-be method of sitting around observing one's navel, sitting around a whole group of people for hundreds of years, staring at a black dot on a white wall, a little closer to your own genetic background, moving into the Middle East, the Mediterranean area, into Europe into more common areas, the Western church. What are people doing when they pray? What are people attempting to do in these contemporary versions of meditation and chanting? What are they attempting to do? What is at the basis of it? Now, I'll tell you what's at the basis of it, is there's always been an awareness. Life has always talked to a few people here and there that were dominant apparent leaders. Some of them stand out in history, some of them stood out a little bit and got cut down, some of them stood out a little bit and you never heard of them. But life was always putting out this information, talking to itself through a certain number of people here and there. That isn't it weird that I'm using you guys, you men and women, you creatures are playing a specific part in my nervous system. This is life talking and I don't really at my highest levels know what I'm going to say next and you people are serving the same purpose on another level lower down and you don't know what you're going to say next and in a sense I can't even predict what you're going to say next how could I make you and me be aware of what's going on contemporaneously in you instead of this great cosmic flow that seems to run everything forget notions of God and all that, that something is keeping it all alive, a great blood system, a great respiratory system, that the whole universe is circulating blood and it's inhaling in and out, and it grows and it gets wounded and it heals itself and it gets older after growing up. And yet, at its level, it cannot tell itself what it's doing. And at your level, you've got to see not because I say so, and it does not take 40 years in a monastery under my tutelage. Well, if it does take it, you ain't going to get it. For you to simply turn on yourself and realize that you can't turn your mind on itself to tell you what's going on. You try it, and apparently all you're left with is the thing attempting to look. Where'd my mind go? Where'd my daydreams go? And ordinary people, even if this is pointed out, think, well, hell, that's some kind of parlor trick. Well, hey, that's kind of curious. Got to go, getting late, and that's the end of it. The notion has always been floating around, as all of you have heard some form of, that there'd be of great benefit in some way if a man really knew himself. In our part of the world, it's normally traced back to the Greeks, but you can trace it back to wherever the Garden of Eden story was for every manifestation of humanity on this planet, that once this yellow circuit began 
to be able to form words and create a non-physical memory. As soon as it created a word, that in a sense is when it came alive, but in another sense, that's when it became diluted at the same time because this thing cannot tell itself what is going on. But note, it says the contrary. Not continually and not specifically, but if you tell people, hey, you don't know what in the hell you're doing, you should know people are going to deny it to the point that you might get a knuckle sandwich if you push the matter. But there has always been these stories, whether it be traceable or whether you follow it as being a philosophical manifestation of the Greeks, you find it in religions, you find it inside the would-be mystical kernels in the religions, you find it in all kinds of systems to just knowledge out on the street. That it would be better if we knew ourselves. But nowadays, in our part of the world, this is no attack because we are still at the cutting edge, but in our part of the world it's come to this, that the knowing of oneself is knowing of one's childhood traumas. It is knowing of the untoward, the unprofitable environmental pressures. That is now known, and it is a kind of mechanical progress from 5,000 years ago. But now, the knowledge of oneself is accepted to mean, all right, if I could remember every time my father popped my little red cheeks when I was a kid and I cried, if I can remember every time that my mother forgot to bring me a present when she went shopping, if I could remember every time that I cried out for a bottle and nobody came and gave it to me until I laid down and cried for 20 or 30 minutes, if I could remember every time that my little playmates mistreated me, if I could remember all of that, then I would know why I am like I am. If what I've just said strikes any of you people as being, yeah, right on, right out. <laughs> That is not it. That sort of psychoanalytic self-knowledge, if it were possible, has served a purpose and it is a bellwether to be already wired up with that attitude is more contemporaneous to life's own growth than it is to still be believing, as you're from your forefathers' religion, that only God knows anything. The gods know anything about humanity, and they've made humanity like it is, and no knowledge is possible. So in a very mechanical, but I must tell you useless way, insofar as doing this in your lifetime, but in a sense, that is a real mark of progress. But you have got to be able to hear as soon as I point out, not as an attack, but something has got to strike you as being, yes, that's true, that the study of one's background, the retelling of one's problems, the being able through hypnotism, through just regular talk analysis, through drugs, through years of going to a psychiatrist, that to be able to think of more and more shitty things that your parents did to you. If you believe that that explains anything, you do not belong here at all, seriously. If you believe that the gods, through some system of preordain preordaining the way in which you grew up, if you believe that you are locked into something, in other words, if you misunderstand that, or put another way, if you understand that correctly, you don't belong here. <laughs> the human mind as it is cannot see that your parents, your peers, the so-called environment is not the environment. It is not something separate from you. The people out there are not in some way wired up in a different way. I don't care if your parents mistreated you compared to the norm of wherever and what, whenever you grew up. 
If your parents made you wear knickers to school back in the 60s, if they made you wear your hair green and a punk haircut before anybody ever heard of it, if your parents made you smoke marijuana while you were attending a private Christian academy in Mobile, Alabama, that explains nothing to say, well, look, I am now all screwed up. And it's because of that. It is not. And if you believe it is at all, if you seriously entertain voices that disagree with what I just said, you do not belong in this. Since I mentioned the old idea of predestination that you can find traces all the way from aspects of the so-called Hindu faith all the way into Western forms of Pentecostal or Protestantism, if you understood it, as long as some of you newer people get upset, let's, you might as well be really upset, uh, there's more truth to that than you'd imagine. But why dwell on that and give you the blues? We could dwell on a second. It is not predestination by some god somewhere. It's predestination by the dealing of the de gene deck. Everybody gets a hand, and I don't mean applause. All the way back to Adam and Eve, if we accepted some form of Adam and Eve, that we're all from some original, original intertwining of some DNA molecules. After that, everybody got dealt a hand. And this thing expanded. It went from being symmetrical to being asymmetrical. It went from being hot to getting cooler. It went from being local to being nonspecific. That is, you don't know who you are. That consciousness cannot see itself. And the more it becomes nonspecific, the more it becomes cosmopolitan, the less it is down on the farm and yokelism. After that, everybody got dealt a hand, and this thing expanded. It went from being symmetrical to being asymmetrical. It went from being hot to getting cooler. It went from being local to being nonspecific. That is, you don't know who you are. That consciousness cannot see itself. And the more it becomes nonspecific, the more it becomes cosmopolitan, the less it is down on the farm and yokelism, the more it is that life is expanding at a proper rate. But the idea of some kind of predestination is not through some folly, through some attempt, through some curse, through some inexplicable reason of the gods. The reality behind the notion of predestination is simply this. If you can hear it right quick, it's just simple as duck shit once you can hear it. Look at your mother and father. Surely, I'm assuming anybody that had the wherewithal to show up and see a tape of somebody by my name in the great cosmopolitan cities, in the larger cities of our country, I will assume remember something from high school biology. To look at your parents and then look at yourself, that you're five foot six and you got dark hair and your bone structure is rather large. You can look at your parents and see, can you not? Or remember in this little thing of what you read. If not, go grab yourself a quick book or else just take my word for it. You should be able to look at your parents and realize there is no way that I could have ever been six foot three with blonde wavy hair and of a more lithe build. Or conversely, you look at your parents and they are off the boat Irish and you look at them and think, boy, if it only been possible that I could have been Chinese. That, I guess, to all of you, seems to be self-evident. But when it gets to this, everyone believes otherwise for very good reason. Nothing's wrong. The rest of everybody else has got to accept this. It's part of the master stroke, the way things are currently arranged. 
you do not blame your parents for being less than six feet tall. You do not blame your parents for being Caucasian. You do not blame your parents for being Irish when you think, boy, I wish I'd been Chinese. I'd, I've always wanted to be Oriental all my damn life, and it's their fault. You don't say that. But everybody, all ordinary people say, I have a terrible temper, or I have a very poor self-image. I always worry about what people think of me, and it's their fault. You're an idiot. I'm sorry, you're not an idiot. You're a, you're a fine person. And since I'll never be seeing you again, I, I want you to know that I think you're a, a fine person. I'm delighted to have known people like you. <laughs> the structure of what you think of as being your individual personality, mind, consciousness, is subject absolutely to the same deal of the genetic deck that made you white, black, male, female, oriental, caucasian. The same thing. And some of you, some people that hear me talk for the first time, almost get addicted, or sometimes they do get addicted, and they can't really explain it, but note, some of this, at times I can say it, and maybe go through a bit of histrionics, if not theatrics, and work around to it, hit it two or three ways, and many times these things you'll go, yeah. But you've also got to see, you go, yeah, and it's gone. You cannot walk around and hold that awareness that my mind has been me as mechanically produced. I could see it the other night when he put it that certain way. I could just see it. But my mind, what I think of as being me individually, is as subject to what went on in the DNA, DNA in the deal of genetic deck, as I am my height, the color of my skin, my sex, there's no difference And this thing as it is now. At line level consciousness, where everyone ordinarily exists, it cannot hold that awareness. It can't. And those of you that in the beginning do believe that you're getting glimpses of astounding things, then you can't hold it. For you to think that you've missed something, or for you to believe that uh, there's some trick I haven't yet explained to you, you're wrong. It is like the, I could refer to it as gravity, I could refer to it as habit, but it is the current structure of the transfer of energy of, of life through man that tends to hold everything as it is. It tends to hold your consciousness as it is. And for any kind of extraordinary information, for any kind of extraordinary glimpse, which is anything beyond line level consciousness, anything beyond where your brain, your brain and everybody else's is now activated, such as my brain has been as mechanically, physically, literally produced by my parents and of course everything before my parents, that right now in this non-specific, asymmetrical way that my body was produced, my height, color of my skin, my sex. This is no different, and you get a glimpse of it, and it's gone. Because this thing is not arranged to hold that information. It is not necessary. It is possible to do it, but it is not as directly approachable. It is not as simple as everyone believes in the beginning, you and everyone else, and part of why you feel, everybody that gets involved with what I have done, that you feel as though you're being shortchanged, you feel as though I'm holding out something, or if you're lucky, you decide that I don't really know what I'm doing and you leave. That's when you're lucky. That's when you're smart. That's my kind of people. that there is a way above this, but what you think you miss is this sense of a community. It is a sense of absolute, or enough absolute rules of a specific kind and requirements that you feel as though I have made a specific step. I am now a part of something larger than I have been. I am now a part of a body of exceptional people. I am now in some way attached to this leader to this dominant person. He knows more. 
That is ordinarily a part and parcel of any organization, no matter what you believe their extensive purpose was. Now you ask me what to do. I'll assume that anyone hearing, seeing this tape saw last week's. And I would trust that those of you, how about people that saw last week's tape when I let that message be read from Pidablo, and that was the first time they'd been exposed to this. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> let me give you two possibilities, since either you will or you won't. That that message, I want everybody's name. I want names taken, I want them sent to me of anybody who dared to laugh through that and thought it was funny. Or anybody who took that at face value, I want their name also on a different sheet of paper. What to do? There are some specific, there's one specific method, a something that I have never told anyone, and I think the time has come that in the next few weeks I'm going to describe it, I'm going to teach you how to do it, and those who cannot feel it will probably find themselves expendable. I may do it on a regular tape at a weekly meeting, or I may make one and just make it available to you people in other cities who have been listening to the tapes for a specific length of time. But there are some things that can be done. I have developed one that is right up to date and is very specific and covers everything that I have talked about thus far. But there have been other attempts that all of you are aware of. They are now impotent, but there have been attempts throughout history of life talking through certain men, trying to make itself, through the people, aware of what it's doing. One of them is prayer. You find it everywhere. Now forget a religious connection or forget a connection with any specific religion, but all over the world, people talk to themselves. Now, I don't mean the bag people on the streets of Manhattan. They talk to themselves on the basis that they're talking to some external entity, entity that they're talking to the gods. This has been going on, I give you complete assurance. As soon as man could talk, as soon as the yellow circuit got going to the point he could talk, as soon as he got through talking about all the great things like where the women, you know, where they got cold beer in this cave or in this town, within an hour or so, man began to pray prayed to rocks, trees, frogs. The guy in the cave next door that was more dominant prayed to the weather, prayed to the sun. What is prayer about? But don't listen to your own consciousness, parrot some previously wired up notions of gods. But what are people up to that they're always attempting to talk to the gods? are people who apparently are teaching some system that say, all right, the secret to this is you've got to continually pray to the gods for assistance. You've got to pray for guidance because I'm giving you the basic information. I'm telling you everything that our former prophets have told us. I'm re I've read from you from our holy book. But after that, it's between you and the gods. And you've got to communicate with the gods. And of course, most religions, as you know, have some form of prayer. There's a kind of ritual involved, which is a kind of support of the cohesive feel of a community is everybody pray on the same knee, everybody pray at the same time of day, everybody turn the same direction, everybody pray, of course, to the right God, our God, Larry or Sam or whoever it was. But the most common apparent way to do this thing in religion and one of the mill mystical groups is I'll reveal the kind of information that the gods have given me. I'll reveal my interpretation of past teachers. But then it gets down to this. It's between you and the gods. You're going to have to get down the trenches with it. You're going to have to sweat blood and bullets. You're going to have to pray to the gods. There's some things I can't answer for you. 
I can't tell you why there's evil in the world, why we've got to die. Of course, remember, that's them. I can tell you. But away from depressing matters. <laughs> you and the gods have got to communicate. You have got to pray to the gods. And then, as always, there are two great possibilities. Some of the major, or one of particular major religion in the world, one and a half, and then many of some minor offshoots of these religions believe that once you've got the holy word, once you've got the word from the gods is revealed to some men, once you've got some holy scriptures, you can then, through some kind of process, you can bring yourself into a greater understanding of what the gods meant through your own efforts, through study, through scholarship, through debate, through discussion with other like-minded religious people. The other, the more common, is the idea of revelation. That if you continually read the holy words, if you think about the holy words, and if you pray, the gods may. The gods may suddenly reveal to you the answers to all of your inquiries. They may offer the spiritual balm for all of your wounds and your ills and your itches. Then again, they may not. I can't tell. You know, I work for them just like you do. I'm praying every day just like you, but I'm telling you what he told me. So he may or he may not, you know, which is a pretty cheap thing to put on their gods, but that he may just in a blinding flash, flash reveal to you all you want to know, which has always been referred to as you know, enlightenment. They're all talking about one thing, though. They're not talking about a recounting of one's ills, they're not talking about finding the place for the blame because in religious terms, it's always the blame of the enemy. If your parents mistreated you, it was because of the enemy. The devil made them do it. If your playmates mistreated you, it's because they were not living an upright Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, whatever, fill in the blank, life. They were not in contact with the gods. They are talking about a kind of rebirth. I mean, the religions, of course, have used the term. And I point out to you, in a sense, it is quite true. You'd be surprised. Some of you have been around for a while and just taken too much of what I said at face value. They thought I'd put a great distance between you and religions. You got more in sense, you got more in common with religions than you know. You got more in common with everybody from the Pope, learned rabbis to down home fire and brimstone preachers. You'd be surprised how close you are to them. So what they're doing with, in a sense, they're trying to give anatomy lessons, and they're using things like describing your genitals as a little Willy Winkle, and <laughs> they're trying to describe serious matters, and they're still playing with graffiti from the bathroom. They're trying to explain atomic physics while not going any further past basic uh, arithmetic. It's not that they're wrong, but they're far removed from what is possible. It is a kind of rebirth, but it is absolutely physical, and it's not down in your soul, and it's not down in your heart. It is a biochemical change in the nervous system, in the brain itself, that activates parts that are now not activated, wherein, in a sense, you are a new person because you are not limited to this equation of either you do or you don't, and that equals all possibilities. It's then that either you do or you don't equals all possibilities. It's simply one part of a brand new either or. Either I am conscious enough to stand aside from either you do or you don't equals everything, or else I am in the midst of either you do or you don't, equals everything. Of course, when you're in the midst of the latter, you're not aware of the former. You've forgotten it. And then you wonder what in the hell is going on. Then some of you wonder what in the hell I just said, and it was yeah. crystal clear. <laughs> Notwithstanding the comments last week that I allowed to be read from that notorious, if I may be so bold as to say it, Pidablo, people don't know what to do. 
If I do not change my mind, as I said, I am going to give out a something that I've never given out. There can be a cutoff line for some of you people, new and some of you people older, because you can't get away from it. And I can give you something specifically to do continually. But in the past, they've used the idea of prayer. They have used ideas of sitting in one position and attempting to meditate. Attempting to meditate on one thing like the virtues of God or attempting to meditate on a black spot in the middle of a big white painted wall. To attempt to meditate on some word. Grunion, grunion. And to sit there and <laughs> just meditate on it. Of course, as always, I'm being foolish. They would meditate on something like, you know, Moses, Moses. Larry, Larry. Holy, holy. They are attempting to heal a kind of wound. They are attempting to heal within the body of life and then within their own brain this thing that's caught up in that either you do or you don't. They describe it according to the time and the place and the DNA structure of the people involved. They try to describe that I am attempting to become in direct contact with the higher forces. Other ways, other times it's described, what I'm trying to do is cut off my connection with the lower forces. I'm trying to still these troubled waters of my own mind. If I do, I just know something glorious will happen. People want to know what to do. But you've heard all this somewhere along the line. And some of you that's heard a few of these tapes or read some of my books have picked up pieces of this. And this is not mystical, and this will not bring about immediate change, but I'm going to tell you brand new people what to do. It's one thing is to stop. You've got to stop. You will stop. Not because I make you stop, but if you continue this and you belong in this, you will stop ever being angry. And of course, you cannot stop being angry until you understand the basis of anger, until you understand, of course, that anger is just a word. Condemnation of anger is just a word. It's just words that say, God, don't want you to be angry. I didn't ever tell you that, but somebody said that. Your religion said that. God does not want you to hate your fellow man. You've got to understand the basis of words. You've got to understand that words are sound that create biochemical molecular, molecular changes in your brain when you hear it. It may or may not apparently have any effect on you. That is, either you do or you don't. You will cease to be angry because you will find out the basis of what anger is. You will simultaneously understand that you cannot attempt to activate higher parts of your circuitry while doing anything that is at the very heart of sustaining the current operation, which is down here. To be a part of either you do or you don't, you've got to be pissed. You've got to be critical. You're supposed to be critical. By God, there's enough in life to be critical about, said he or she, Pidablo. It's your duty to be mad. You can't be mad. We're back to what some of you should find curious for me to say. I'm telling you, you can't do this and be mad, damn it. You can't do this and be critical, because if you do, you're not doing it right. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you personally. I mean, I'm your friend. I won't tell you. The main thing, your main problem is you're too critical. You can't be critical and do this. <laughs> it is a strange onion, my friend. It is a strange onion that cannot be peeled from the outside inwardly. It is a strange onion that does not come about in layers. But enough of the obvious. You cannot be angry. But you can't say. You cannot entertain the voices that say and then live by, hey, everybody is angry, but I'll keep praying. I'll keep praying that I won't be angry. There's a place that is not angry in any sense that you're aware of, and that is in your own nervous system. There is a place where the kind of basic biochemical, electrical activity in the brain itself that is going on that you think of as being you. There are parts of the brain that that activity, that physical activity is not taking place. And you can crank it up. You can get the blood, you can get the juice, you can get the electricity to it. And it is not angry in any way that you're aware of. It's not. It's not then a matter of 
that part saying, well, wait a minute. I'm stronger than the other parts, and uh, I heard that Jesus or Moses or Muhammad said, don't be angry, and I believe I can do it. It's not that. It's that it has no understanding of it. It is not wired up to be angry. Again, I must tell you what you call anger is just a word. But you can't be angry. But you've got to understand why not. I can't just say, nobody be angry. Of course, all of you will fail doing this, but have faith and continue praying to me or to somebody, and perhaps the gods will cut down your anger. Or perhaps we can get together and have discussion groups several nights a week, and we'll all lay it out. We'll all talk about our angers. We'll let it out. We'll discuss our common areas of anger. And I bet that'll help. For you new people, uh, Please don't wait on this. We don't have such meetings. There is nothing to discuss. You've got to be able to understand it, though. And you cannot understand it on the basis of either you do or you don't. You can't understand it at this level. But you cannot be angry. And you've got to understand why not. You can't be critical. You can't be involved in any form of self-pity, of any form. You can't be concerned about your health. Of course, you're back to a form, as some of you people would want to call it, predestination. You've got to have a form of basic health to do this. But you can't be concerned about health. You can't be concerned about death. You can't be concerned about what anybody thinks. You can't be concerned about whether you succeed. But all of these things I've mentioned, nobody can teach you, and I can't make you do it. There's no way I can make you do it. And there's certainly no possible way for me to say, all right, everybody's got to do it when I know damn well that you can't do it. And then you got a what? Another stage of what? And I got another stage of being me. I got another stage of being upset. I tried so hard. You, I, you seem like such a nice person, you knew all about what was going on, but these damn little rules you came, I can't do any of them. So there's nothing gained by that. Although everybody expects that, that's a, a form, a type of a uniform to create a sense of community that I saw it. Everybody has got to stop all forms of hatred and prejudice in your own souls, your own minds, in your little hearts of hearts. You've got to stop it. You've got to stop it before we can do anything else while knowing full well, while understanding from top to bottom that no one can do it. The Pope can't do it. Your rabbi can't do it. Your parents couldn't do it. Your children can't do it. But I say, and through some kind of force of the dominant over the submissive, through the charm and persuasion of my splendid personality and my loud voice, I say nobody can continue this. You can't do anything. If you're hostile in any way, if you're mad, if you're angry at anyone in your mind, in your little soul, you got to stop it. And I know that no one can stop it. Not only would that be unprofitable, but that is what is expected in some form. That is what many of you feel to be lacking, that you don't feel like you're a part of anything because you have a new form of guilt. I mean, how can you tell that you've made some step in the right direction? How can you tell that you've actually joined up unless I, you don't, of course, think about it in this manner, but unless I in some way can offer you a new form of suffering? How else can you tell that you're getting anywhere? It should strike many people as curious. I ran around the edges twice tonight. Of, you know, my little drama of, listen, you can't be angry. I'm telling you, there's one thing, you cannot be angry. And you can't be judgmental. That's the worst thing with some of you, especially, I know you, is always being judgmental and critical of people. That is your biggest flaw. That's going to kill you. 
Assuming that even you new people suspect that there is some kind of, I almost said logic behind my folly, but even I won't be that foolish, that there is something behind the apparent contradictions. Or maybe some of you can even suspect that this is a running form. It's like 4D satire. It is me attempting to sketch out, to point out, hint, sometimes even try to speak rather directly about things that ordinary consciousness cannot hear. That's the only value of any of this, whether it was from me or from somebody else at some other time or some other place. Anything that's ordinarily available, anything that is reasonable, anything that is logical, anything that will fit into your own, either you do or you don't, you must see by now is useless. It has gotten you nowhere, not because it's wrong, not because life has misled you. Everything is arranged in life as it should be. It is you that wants something else. It is you individually. I know what it is. I know how to do it. I didn't get it from a book. I didn't get it from some other person. A few people can do it. It will never be widely popular, but it can be done. And if you are already wired up for you ex, what is it, Methodist? For those of you who are predestined to do this, you know, don't blame me. For those of you who are predestined by the gods to maybe brush up against this and go, holy Batman, what a bunch of crap. Be my guest. It's not my fault either. <laughs> The strangeness, as some of you suspect at times, is that I apparently start nipping at our own heels. That I apparently run maps out in a certain direction, you think it's hit an edge, or maybe I change directions, but sometimes, some of you get glimpses that apparently I have run all the way around the universe, or I've created a map wrapped around a cylinder, and we're back somewhere else that you could say was a starting point of one place, and I seem to wrap it up. And if you look long enough, if you can run your consciousness in a certain way, it's like you went around the cylinder, and I didn't really go anywhere. How could one offer great dramatic proclamations denouncing great dramatic proclamations? How can one be critical in any real sense of criticism? How can one denounce denouncers and denouncements? How can you be angry at anger? If anyone gets a glimpse of that, you should understand why I have such a high job classification number with the Labor Department. <laughs> Not only is there nowhere to learn how to do this, it can be done. Of course, it is not that simple. <laughs> it is almost a circle, except it's a spiral. That you start here and you do end up almost where you were, except you're up a notch. If that were not so, then this would be the extent of human life. Those of you that had your own internal wiring that first heard that and went, Jesus, you know, give me the blues, why don't you? Or what's the purpose in anything if that's the only possibility is of either you do or you don't and that's it? That would be a perfect cylindrical mouth. That would be circumventing, circumnavigating the whole universe as they imagine sometimes is running the beam of light out there and it'll eventually come back and hit you in the back of the head or the back of the flashlight. That didn't go anywhere. This goes somewhere, but it does not go somewhere in a straight line and it does not go anywhere in the way in which you uniformly expect it's going to go, that someone's going to say, all right, you people, go there. And when you get through over there, go over there. And when you get through with that, do this. And then fill it back up, and then go back over here. Right oh. Thank you, Jesus. Bless me, God, I'll dig it, and I'll fill it back up. And I'll sweat. I'll do what is required. 
but at least tell me what's required. Give me something that I can put my hands on. Give me a shovel. You can't do anything to hurt yourself. I think I will use as a wrap up for tonight's message. Everything that all religions have apparently ever taught, everything that you have imagined to be true upon its face, every axiom, proverb that you have struck you as being loaded with potency, all have to do with this. You can't see it at the ordinary level. And I can, guess I can make it into relatively verbal sanity as much as anything else right here on the spot. But it all has to do with you can't harm yourself, but it's not the ordinary level. It's not as ordinary consciousness would perceive it. Such ideas as don't hate thy fellow man. Let's say that all religions in some way teach. All right, I've told you, you cannot do this and be mad. But it's not on the basis that ordinary consciousness takes it. That is, that if you hate other people, the gods disapprove of it. You know, you're going to make other people feel bad. Uh, you're sh sowing dissension in life. That in some way it is specifically connected with other people to be mad at them. But it's not. That's not the point. To be mad at somebody is to hurt yourself if you're attempting to do this. If you're attempting to make any effort to activate your own brain, your own consciousness above where it is, you're hurting yourself. Well, some of you have already found out, I've told you, you cannot constantly drink alcohol, as simple as that seems, as much as I like good cold beer. You people cannot go around drinking day in and day out. You cannot take in alcohol on a constant basis without hurting yourself. And it's got nothing to do with any religion, any so-called cultural norm. It doesn't even have anything to do with your damn health. That's not even the point. I don't care whether your liver got the size of Rhode Island. That's not it. You are hurting yourself from top to bottom because all of that is a part of line level consciousness. All of that is a matter of either you do or you don't. Hey, would you like to have a drink after work? Sure. Next day, would you like to have one? Yeah. Next day, nobody asks you, you ask you. Should we have a drink? Yeah. You're harming yourself. Let's assume that everyone agrees to that in theory. If you overeat every day, if you eat food that makes you dream of wide vistas, as far as your little dreaming mind sees, of thundering buffaloes, snorting fire, and every night you continue eating, whatever it is that would produce such nightmares. <laughs> You're hurting yourself. If you lay around on the couch as soon as you get home and stuff yourself with candy bars and never get any physical movement, any activity, any exercise, you're hurting yourself. Let's assume that all of that would seem plain enough whether voices in you like them all or not. To be angry is to hurt yourself just as much is to overeat, is to hurt yourself attempting to do this just as much as taking in alcohol on some regular basis. That is literally physically true. I know all about it just because I don't describe everything in physical, biological details. I guess one more time I should mention this because I get little hints of it from some of you people and I know it's more widespread. Some of the things I describe in physical terms, talking about the brain and the nervous system. Uh, I have, I'm aware of the fact that some of you want to bite your fingernails. Some of you almost get on the verge of feeling embarrassed for me. You want to clip out things or you want to recommend a textbook that you even remember something from college about the physiology of man that sounds like I'm almost talking about it and you want to ask me, are you aware of the fact that there's a system that everybody knows about, all teachers of biology and physiology and all doctors, just any old doctor, even chiropractors know about this, and you seem to be torn around the edges of it like it's something you made up and you, you made up these funny terms for it, 
but you're almost talking about a certain certain system or process. Do you know about that, or is it just something you kind of stumbled on? <laughs> Would you give me a break? I'll tell you one more time, everything that I talk about, when it gets into certain areas, when I start really dragging in a lot of information that could make a difference in someone, that is a map that seems to get fairly detailed and specific. Don't try and figure this out, but I'm just telling you, in a sense, I always put in, or I create a kind of flaw, and there's a reason for it. When I talk in ways that seem to be physically direct, don't listen to voices in you that want to connect this with something that you remember from high school or college biology or physiology. We're talking on a different level in the same way that I told you about that substance in the blood. And I point out to you that no one can find it. They can't find it for one reason. They don't have it in their blood. And when they try to look for it, they can't see it. If it was there. There's nobody that could ever prove that it exists. Unless they came for the new test and I wanted to volunteer, perhaps. If it would have to be a test, I'd have to invent the test. But it is a fact. And many of you can already feel it. When you can activate the nervous system, of course, all this begins to eat upon itself. It's not that one thing follows another. This is all connected into another dimension. It just apparently works in some kind of process that one thing happens and it seems to cause something else. Well, when you can get conscious above this level, when you can get the brain activated, as strange as this may sound to some of you, not some of you will like it because you think it's not strange enough already, so this sounds strange. You can feel a certain kind of, dare I say it, how about a certain kind of warmth? Not down in a little heart or soul somewhere, that little Jesus or somebody blessed your soul. You can feel a warmth up here in the brain, and it has to do with the blood flow. But yet you will not find this in any book on biology or physiology. You won't find anyone who has any notion that this goes on. But it do go on with a few people. You cannot activate the brain above that level without affecting everything else. Of course, in your left, you've got to affect everything else to do that. That's why the mouth spirals on itself. It begins at times to apparently eat itself up. That is why at times I have drastically, before you knew it, changed the direction apparently of what I was talking about. It will eventually consume itself verbally. It's not a psychological phenomenon. It is not a spiritual defect of some sort that I produce enough new information in words. I didn't make up the information but I produce a form for it, and it eventually dies. That again leaves a hole in what people ordinarily expect to be a kind of community, that there should be tenets to this, there should be a dogma, there should be a teaching to it, something that you upon which you can depend. That I say so and so is true and here are things to do, and you wander off and you come back two years later and it's never mentioned again. Or apparently I've had a great change of mind and we were going in this direction as best you could. You went and talked about it and compared notes to other people. You wandered off and then came back. And you were you just there was no doubt I was going like this. You went out and even talked to other people about it for several years and got other people interested. You find out there's some more public meetings going on. You come around to see, you know, how far I'm taking it now, and apparently I'm going over here. That boy, I had a great change of mind. I must have seen the light. Something happened. It goes so far, and the physical energy potential of any description, any knowledge, crumbles. 
It does not happen at that rate of speed in the ordinary world, or else you would not have people still studying the Old Testament, people still revering the words of Confucius. You would not have people involved with ancestor worship. Or for the really hip, you wouldn't have people that could even remember what happened yesterday, much less to take it seriously. <laughs> How is it that something can be talked about whose subject, in a sense, is there's nothing to talk about? How can you alleviate, alleviate the suffering, the discomfort of people, when there is none? How can you help people who need no help? How can you lead people that don't want to go anywhere? It's easy enough to make jokes of a certain sort, and there are even jokes that are available in the memory and the literature of humanity along these lines. That the real message from somebody who actually understood that the closest thing to real message is no message at all, except at the ordinary level that is back to either you do or you don't. And somebody could come out and say, I know it all. I am the most enlightened person on earth, and I'm going to come here one time to you people who have showed up, and I'm going to tell you what it is that you need to know. I'm going to tell you the secret. That is, there is no secret. The message that all of you are looking for is no message. That's it and the figure disappears. All of humanity, let's assume, heard it and showed up. Could be divided into two classes of reaction to what was said. One group either believed it or they didn't. So that kind of message, that kind of joke, even though they have survived and are still repeated up until today. And by certain groups of people, they're repeated with a great knowing look. Hey, you remember when Master so-and-so in 1352 told the students after years of meditating and chanting and hard work, he said, the secret, my son, is or something like that. The secret is, and he poked him in the eyes like Mo does Curly. Or he says the secret is, come closer, and he goes, <laughs> all of that. That's just a variation of me saying the secret is, there is no secret. Or the only true message for those who can hear it is, it's all a variation of that. And at the ordinary level, it may titillate people, it may cause a little laughter, but there is a reality to it. But the reality cannot be comprehended at the ordinary level. If it could, I'd have told you that. I'd say, all right, the message, what everybody thinks they're searching for, the great secrets, want to be part of a community, want to be closer to the gods, the forces actually help create beneficial change the forces that are at least benign to your own self-improvement. The message of how to arrive there, the message of how to do it, is this in one word. It doesn't do anyone any good. And yet, that's about the size of it. If you can get above binary consciousness, if you can get above the either-or equation of either you do or you don't, to where the either you do or you don't is an either-or part of a brand new sense of consciousness, 
not psychological, physical. Of the brain being activated in a certain way, then you would understand that you have been sitting here listening to me talk for years. You've been attempting to do certain things for years. You thought you heard certain things for years. Then you understand that in a sense, I said nothing. Nothing. Because all we talked about, 99% of the time, all we talked about was down in the either you do or you don't world. And 1% of the time, I could almost make you aware of it periodically, that hey, all of this is a waste of time. And then you realize it was, other than the fact that that was the only way possible. That if you live in Manhattan, God forbid about the only efficient way to get to Richmond is to go through New Jersey. After you get there, you can say, it didn't help much going through New Jersey. <laughs> and the understanding, and that's just a word. I know to many of you people that still has mystical connotations that you think that I mean, you know, understanding with a capital U and with quotation marks around it. I am talking about literally the brain beginning to operate up here in a place above where it operates in you and everyone else. That area can see from a different view, and all this is still words and not exactly it. It does not dislike anyone. It does not see any evil in the world. It is not mad. It is not even passionate enough to pound on a podium and go through what I've gone through with you people. It's not passionate enough in the ordinary sense to say shame on you people or to say you've wasted my time. For me to say I'm sick of doing this and I don't know how in the hell I ended up in this job. And that no one's ever going to see it to the point that I was at first made to believe that they could see it. It's none of that. And this message then if that became a strong enough part of the equation that that is prim primarily where you resided, that that is secretly then where your viewpoint was, where your consciousness physically was, the blood, the movements of all the chemical transmitters was operating in a part of the brain on a continual basis in you, and you still looked as ordinary as you do now. You still went about your everyday duties as you had to, but it was operating on a continual basis up there. If I took you out in public, assuming of course I knew that was going on in you, and I said, I want you to tell these people, you're one of the ones that I know what's going on. You're the ones, the ones that's come closer to what I thought was possible when I was forced to start this. Now we got a new group of people and I want you to do one thing, I want you to tell them what this is about. But if you slip over the line of saying anything that would mislead them, anything, if you say anything that is mechanical in nature, that makes two and two be four in a way that they either do or don't, I got the power and will take it away from you, what you've done, what's happened to you. And that's all right, tell them. You know what you'd tell them? <laughs> <laughs> then again, compared to everything else that you've always received from life and what some of you think you can get from me from all these dramatics, wouldn't that be a pleasant message? What if you found that, that was the message? To be able to see that everything is just right and not struggle against being mad, not pray to God somewhere to some non-existent force outside the system that's not a part of the system as much as you are, to pray to something that never can give you what you're praying for. 
that's always held out to a future li imaginary life or some blame placed on some imaginary previous life. But to right now be able to see it and your message and you understood that all real messages are Are you sure that wouldn't be a rather pleasant message?